Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Now that autumn has finally begun, it's the perfect time to delve into one of my very favorite autumn tales, The Lord of the Rings, a story about journeys, beginnings, and ends. As such, today's guest is Professor Rachel Fulton Brown, who's an associate professor of medieval history and fundamentals at the University of Chicago. Her fields of specialty include the history of Christianity, medieval liturgy, and the cult of the Virgin Mary. However, today we're here to talk about one of her other academic interests, the work of J.R.R. Tolkien, which she teaches about in a course, Tolkien, Medieval and Modern, at the University of Chicago. For so many of us, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings were childhood staples, but it was a real pleasure in this conversation to be able to take a step back and look at the political and theological implications of this really great work of literature. So with no further ado, let's jump in. Professor Fulton Brown, welcome to the show. We're really, really delighted to have you. I'm I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I want to kick this off before we dig into the weeds a little bit here. I mean, it's sort of a basic question, but even in Tolkien's lifetime, it was quite controversial. I mean, whether or not something like this could be considered an academic course of study. And so in a sense, the fact that we're sitting here having this conversation about this fantasy novel that m- many people have dismissed as simply children's books and nothing more as a serious topic of conversation in and of itself is a little bit unusual. And it's uncommon for someone like you to teach at a major university and yet have all this academic work that's on Tolkien. So why is that? And why do you think it's worthwhile for someone like you who reads real medieval history to dig so deeply into something like the Silmarillion, which fundamentally is made up, it didn't happen. Well, I think it's it's more unusual for me in a history department to be doing the course mm. and not doing it as an English literature course. And when I teach Tolkien, I teach it as um, history, religious studies, and fundamentals. And fundamentals is a major we have at the University of Chicago where you focus on a particular text. So focus doing a course focused on the Lord of the Rings and focused on um, you know Tolkien's craft I, I'm not sure where the unusualness is it's 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 interesting because of course on the one hand doing courses on Tolkien or Lewis or fantasy is considered not true scholarly work but on the other hand for you know in English departments there there's all sorts of study of things on pop culture and hmm. you know c- cultural, craft and things like that. So it, 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 it's interesting that Tolkien can still feel like it's not like real study when in other parts of the academy, you could say that that, you know, that, that sort of current um, cultural approach is appropriate. So I, I, I mean, and, and w- w- the interesting thing about what I do with my course is it's titled Tolkien Medieval and Modern. Right. And that's, supposed to be kind of a question mark. It's like medieval or modern, medieval and, <laughs> and or it's, it's like, what are we doing? And what does Tolkien do that is distinctive uh, from his own scholarly perspective, but also, you know, I think actually also distinctive as a modern author. Yeah. I mean, you are a medievalist and it's kind of interesting to me that, I mean, again, we're talking about a world that's fictional and yet so much mm-hmm. of the interest in it seems to be squarely located in people who are interested in the Middle Ages broadly. Um, I mean, maybe you'll disagree with that assessment. Um, But I mean, I kind of wonder, is that link real? Are there parts of Tolkien that are like fundamentally medieval that are, are drawing people from that specific field of study to him? So there are sessions, regular sessions at the International yeah. Medieval Congress in Kalamazoo on Tolkien. So among medievalists, and I think you know the number of us who are professional medievalists who started as children reading Tolkien is is probably large. <laughs> um, I I still think though my approach as a Tolkien scholar is maybe a little different from the colleagues in my field that I can think of, and um, let me. T- I sort of categorize it, right? There's there's people who study Tolkien in literature departments, and based on the kinds of papers they give at the conferences, they're 
I mean, they're interested in storytelling. They're interested in elements of his source material. They're interested in themes and and so forth. Um, when I when I have the students come to the class, I, I I say you know this is not a literature course in that sense, right? The way I think about Tolkien is you know more like monastic. I'd say that mm. I see him as taking on the project of creativity from within a prayerful a life of prayer, and mm. that that I don't know of many people in the academy that deal with Tolkien from that perspective. Outside the academy, there's I, I do have students that come to the class who are often, you know, they've read Tolkien in, uh, you know, they grew up in a Catholic school or something like that. They've read him from that perspective. Getting the two to meet is really difficult, right? The the sort of deep, d- detailed study of models and sources and, you know, proper appreciation of his philological and historical practice with an understanding of why, you know, you would say he's a Christian author, which he absolutely is. I, I, I think that we can talk about that more de- deeply. But the, the problem in the academy and the problem I've had and the problem I try to address in my class is how do you bring those two together, right? How do you bring not just the medieval and modern, but also the, the um, world building? People like often say the, the imaginary world building alongside of a more theological, philosophical, I mean, aesthetic approach and and that that's i think what makes my my approach based on my you know experience and in, in what other people have done talking about tolkien my my approach is sort of at an intersection that not most not many other people deal with well so let's dig it onto the medieval versus modern here i mean i think I mean, you you and I talked a little bit before this, so you know that I read a lot of Lewis and Lewis amongst people I've read talking about the Middle Ages is probably the one who has, at least that I've read, talked most compellingly about difference in worldview, those kind of really fundamental differences between the medieval and modern world. So from your reading of Tolkien, what parts of it are fundamentally medieval and what parts of it are fundamentally modern? So I, it's interesting bringing up Lewis and Tolkien make a good contrast because yeah. they're, they're they're friends but they're not the same, right? Um, and Lewis, I mean, you're you're thinking things like his discarded his, image, yeah, his his mainly, lectures, yeah. the discarded image. Um, he and and he his, his major scholarly work was what he called his O Hell, which is not a, which is not a curse word. It's the O H E L, <laughs> the Oxford History of English. <laughs> <laughs> literature, right? Um, for the 16th century, that Lewis throughout was always essentially Anglican. Right. I mean, when he converts to Christianity, he converts to Ang- Anglicanism, not Catholicism. And there, there's already a difference and a divide, right? Tolkien, his mother was a Catholic convert. He grew up, you know, with, after she died, he, his, his um, guardian was a priest. And, you know, he was Catholic throughout his life. And, you know, with, with his, his spiritual practice there, you're already in a, in a very different Mm -hmm. world because Lewis is looking at a world that feels lost, right? Right. That discarded image, that, that one that he's longing for Mm -hmm. to be true. Tolkien simply experiences it as true. And I Mm -hmm. do think there is, there is a, there's a powerful difference there. You gave me some questions to think about beforehand and saying, it's like, what, what makes, what makes the Lord of the Rings essentially medieval? From my perspective, it's because it's written from within this perspective of um, the reality of myth, right? That the the story that Tolkien is telling, he feels is real from within. Lewis, I think, is he's always looking around at the edges and knowing that he's not quite inside in the same way. Tolkien writes as if he he simply assumes the world perspective that he's writing from within. Although, I mean, from his legendarium perspective he invents it but right it, if if you read things like um beowulf obviously which tolkien lectured on or pearl sir gawain which he translated um he's trying to write literature that would make sense from their worldview i think and so always when he says fundamentally catholic it's it's not necessarily fundamentally modern politically catholic with the popes and 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 certain doctrinal um, arguments, it's from within the perspective of what does the world look like when this is truth, 
And I, I can unpack that a little bit more if you if you want. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear like some specific examples. Well, so there's the sort of best introduction to all of Tolkien's thinking about his work is in his letters. And um, there's one letter that he writes to um, Camilla Unwin, who's his publisher's daughter, who had asked him for a school project. What is the 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 purpose of life? And hmm. I think it's a purpose or meaning it's purpose. Right. And he says, well, the, 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 you can't ask that question unless you're asking it of some, some, you know, creator. He, he sets it up fairly nicely in the, in the, in the pages. And, but he ends up with it saying, if, if, if there's no creator, then it's meaningless, right? There's, there's no purpose. You can't, you, who would you address the question to? But if you do have, you know, say, like, what is the purpose of life? The purpose from his perspective is praising God. And, and you can see that within the Silmarillion, it's, it's, it's submerged in framing for the Lord of the Rings, but it's there throughout all of his stories that our purpose in life is to sing praises to the creator. I don't get that. I don't get that strong sense with Lewis. I mean, he's, he's interested in the sort of um, philosophical question of why I should be Christian. Tolkien never sets it up that way. He's just, mm. how do we praise the creator? How do we sing? How do we sing beautifully to um, the maker? And, you realize that's the, the opening of Cermillion is that creation story. It's the Aina Lindele where the, he, the Iluvatar proposes the song to the, the Ainer and they sing it. And then this review, all of that, it's a revelation of our experience of being within a great artifact. Again, Lewis is not asking the question from quite that perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, maybe this is just like my Protestant brain, but when I read the opening of the Cermillion for the first time, I was like, this is really pagan. And I was kind of shocked <laughs> by it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I went back earlier today and I looked at it again. And, uh, you know, I, I felt a little bit more conflicted about it on the second mm. reading. I mean, I think the first time I read it, I just thought it looked like the Kalevala, which for the listeners who don't know is the Finnish national epic. So pre-Christian roots, similar vibe to you know Hesiod or the Iliad or something like that and then I looked at it again and I mean it it's much more positive than something that you would get from something like Greek myth um, or Norse myth or most other mythologies that I'm familiar with but I was looking at it today and I thought oh I know what it looks like it looks like Timaeus so I guess defend for me a little bit I mean between kind of these three options here there's looking at it as this is a Christian creation myth because it's happy and there's nothing pagan about it. It's just creating angels. It's not really creating other deities. There's the, well, I mean, they seem, if you just sort of take it at face value, they seem rather deity-like what he's making. And then there's, I guess, the platonic interpretation, which, I mean, there's quite a bit of debate about whether that would be a more monotheistic or polytheistic interpretation. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, the Tolkien, what's interesting about it is he always wants to invent a world where mythology is real, but doesn't conflict with Trinitarian theology. Mm, okay. Um, he has at his disposal elements of the Christian mythology that most modern Christians aren't terrifically aware of mm. that include things like, oh, if you read Job really carefully, there's this this reference to um, when when God is defending himself to Job and saying, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When when the morning stars sung for joy mm. and that morning stars, it's I, I can't remember the first number. It, the, the, the morning stars singing, those are angels. The Anilindale, and I, I, I show this in, in our, our readings for the class, is actually echoing um, creation story that we have in Jubilees, which ah. is an Old Testament apocrypha that I'm pretty sure Tolkien could have known about because it, it's published in in his in in his lifetime. Um, that has like deep deep roots. It's in the Coptic. It's in the to Coptic tradition. We have you know these ancient ancient stories. It's it, it's like the backstory for Genesis, which is. Moses is on the mountain and the angel um, comes to him on Mount Sinai and explains to him the story of creation. And in, in fact, includes day one where the angels are singing all of the elements. So it, what's curious about it is Tolkien, the Anilindale is absolutely strictly within that 
understanding mm. of creation, but that understanding of creation is not active in the version of Genesis that most you know Christians know now, because that version of Genesis, the one that we have in our Bibles, doesn't have the frame story of, yes, this was told to Moses on the mountain and these were angel, an angel told him and the angels are there at the beginning. So I, I was referencing Tolkien's letters. He, he tells Camilla, you know, a purpose is praising God. He writes another wonderfully beautiful letter to his son, Christopher, where he's saying, you know, how to keep, keep um, heart up in the, in the midst of being in World War II. <laughs> Christopher is. And um, his father is telling him, well, what I do, keep the praises with you at all times. And he means um, this, the the Psalms 148, 149, and 150, which are the Laudate, right? The Laudate Dominum praise, which include praise of all the creatures. Um, but he also lists the Benedicite, which is um, in the Septuagint Bible, and therefore in the medieval tradition of the Benedicite, right? The blessing, bless the Lord, all the creatures. And again, the list is all of those angels. So if you read the Anilindale with the Benedicite and all the creatures singing the praises of, of God alongside, you realize Tolkien is completely within a, a Christian understanding. However, it's a Christian understanding that is more familiar to those, to those who are familiar with the medieval expressions than maybe some more modern, you know, mythologically stripped out <laughs> mm. uh, v- variants that more modern Christians are familiar with. So then, so, cause I mean, Jubilees is an ancient text, but was Jubilees in fact read much more during the middle ages than it is now? I, no, because it was lost. <laughs> that That's a problem. Ah. The Benedicite, B- the Benedicite is, however, it's it's in it's at Lauds, right? Every morning at and and particularly so for example in my prayer practice I use the hours of the Virgin, which is you know, Matins and Lauds in the morning. And Lauds includes the Benedicite. So in fact, pretty much as I'd like to say about um every Christian who could read would know the little office of the Virgin because that's what they used to learn to read. So <laughs> so yes, it would have been there. They would have known the praises of the creatures. And it's also much, there's also much more active angelology in, mm. in the Middle Ages, and therefore this this sort of overlap between the angels and the and the creatures singing the praises that feels it feels sort of um, familiar and and medieval to me, and therefore when Tolkien is saying you know I'm I'm within the 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 Christian understanding it's it's another of the reasons like he doesn't have he got very nervous about having any other worship practices in the story in mm. the Lord of the Rings. I mean, everybody would say, but they don't, there's no temple. There's no sacrifices. There's nothing in fact, pagan in them. What there are, are the songs of all of the characters throughout the story. So, and those are, and, and the, the Eagles, when the, when the tower of Sauron falls, the Eagles fly to Gondor and sing a Psalm. In, in fact, right. It just, it sounds like, in the Vulgate numbering Psalm 23, it was mm-hmm. open the gates, the King of glory is coming. Mm. Uh, the return of the King, right? So there's 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 that element. Um, you know, conversely, the you know the only time that there is a temple in Tolkien's Legendarium, it's in the Second Age with the fall of Numenor, when Sauron in embodied form is with the Numenorians on their special island, right? It's like it's it's between the blessed lands of the the gods and middle earth and they're on this special island and sauron shows up there and convinces them that they need a temple and they need to do sacrifices and Mm. you know by doing this they will you know achieve longevity which is what they envy from the elves in the blessed realm and they end all end up in human sacrifice right (laughs) so you know if you want to think what tolkien thinks is evil it's oh guess what you know human sacrifice so he is it's like he's trying to skirt around a reality that includes the create creation through the angelic participation, at least in, in their singing, as against uh, a corrupted worship that what is Sauron, what is, is what Sauron's trying for, right? He wants to be God. So he's basically Satan. And right. and he well Morgoth is Satan, but Sauron is his, his agent. He wants the, the you know the creatures of the world bound to him through the ring not recognizing the the the, the glory of the creator hmm. i mean it's interesting 
the the fact of that there's no outward paganism really in Lord of the Rings is is much remarked upon because the reverse is also true. You know, there's no kind of outward discussion of of Christianity. I mean, he has an interesting quote about it in which he says, I have not put in or have cut out practically all references to anything like religion or cult practices in the imaginary world. And I think it's, I mean, it's sort of interesting to me, the last episode, we talked a little bit about kind of this Rawlsian liberalism that's like, you shouldn't have references to religion in public settings. And it seems to me almost as if that attitude is a parallel to that in some way. I mean, I, I'm assuming you're going to disagree, but talk talk me through how this is a different attitude from that. Why would there be no need to take it in or take it out? You're right. I do. I do say it's different, <laughs> but you're right. You're right to point to it as as a potential problem for Tolkien because since he doesn't have, as most people recognize, you know, overt Christianity in the story. What I have had students in over the years tell me, it's like, I don't have to, you know, Tolkien's not really a Catholic, it doesn't matter whether, whether he says it's an actually fundamentally Catholic work, you know, mm. unconsciously in the beginning, but consciously in the revision as, as the phrase is. Yeah. Um, because I don't, you know, it's not there. And I, if I want to read it differently, you know, I, ha- I can. I'm like, well, yes, right. of course, you know, that, that, is, a, <laughs> that is a concern <laughs> when we, we approach literature. Can we overread it? For example, when the Christian yeah. exegetes read the um, pagan myths and find in them Christianity. Okay, fine. You, you know, you, you can do it the other direction. Um, the, the, the problem was that, okay, the, the, the most important thing to keep remembering is that what Tolkien cares about is creation. And, and that's what he says in the poem that he wrote for Lewis about why mythology matters, the mythopoeia. And he's saying, you know, we make still by the law in which we're made. We tell stories and that's, all, you know, that's okay. We, you know, we sub, sub creating within this refracted light of, of creation. It, 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 it is interesting that Tolkien, he doesn't seem so inc- focused on the incarnation, right? The, hmm. the entry of God into yeah. his creature. But he does talk about it once in one of the, the, the you know, his Apocrypha, right? The, the things mm. that Christopher found and published later in the history of Middle Earth. And there's a conversation that Tolkien writes between an elf and a woman, um, Finrod and Andreth. And mm. um, Finrod is Galadriel's brother. Oh, golly. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I should, I memorize all of these lineages. And then I, <laughs> I, I forget. The, the important thing is that Andreth is in love with Finrod's brother, and that means so Andreth, the woman is in love with an elf and the elf has gone off to war. He, he in fact dies before she does. But the, the worry is about what do you do with the long lived elves falling in love with a human being? Mm. And in talking about that, they're talking therefore about the problem of death and immortality, which is a major theme for Tolkien. And it comes up incidentally in this conversation of like, what happened to you men? You know, like hmm. you, you seem, you know, distressed and sad and like, well, there was something that happened back there in the East, right? Which we don't want to talk about. And there is a story that, um, you know, somehow it's all going to be fixed maybe if, and, the, and then there's this, this is the closest Tolkien ever got to saying is like how he saw the, the incarnation in relation to his own story. What if the maker entered into his artifact right? The singer into his song, wouldn't it just shatter the whole thing? And I'm like, that to me is the best description anybody's ever given of what the problem the incarnation is. Hmm. You are saying the creator entered into his own made thing. Right. Mind blown. Right. Right. And that is why I say Tolkien is always fundamentally Christian because he's always focused on this tension between the creation and the longing to be in contact with the creator. In, mm. in, in that way. And, and what he says in his on fairy stories is the gospels are the greatest fairy story ever written, right? That they, they, they are this, this entry of the Lord into his artifact history and legend of met and fused, right? So that they are um, participating in that longing and desire for the eucatastrophe. I mean, the, anybody who studies Tolkien encounters all of this, but it, it's it's been what I've been meditating on for all these years, saying he wants to understand what it means to be creatures loved by a creator. And 
therefore, if you actually, one of my lectures in, in, in Tolkien, very light, it's like, what kind of story is the Lord of the Rings? And, and I say, I'll put it to you. And then I read all of these passages where the, the refrain of Lord of the Rings throughout is love, right? It, it's basically a love story. They love the land. They love each other. They love, you know, the love of, um, you know, Gimli for Galadriel, of Sam for Frodo, of the hobbits for the Shire, of Aragorn for Arwen, of Boromir for Gondor, all of it. It's a grand love story. Mm. And you realize that is for Tolkien, the gospel, right? It's this, this love just and it just shimmers throughout the whole, the whole cre- his whole meditation on what it is to be our the, the creatures that we are. I want to put a pin in the immortality point, but before we get too far off of it, did I open my book this morning and just completely make up this Timaeus Silmarillion connection, or is there something to it? Um, so there would be something <laughs> to it because it's medieval, right, 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 which was well read in the Middle Ages. Right. And that, that particularly in the 12th century, um, there's a whole Chartres school of Neoplatonists who are reading the Timaeus and therefore meditating on the creation. Okay. So backing <laughs> up, there, there's another way of, so how would a Christian think about this? And it's like, this is how, how does Tolkien, who spends his life lecturing on Beowulf, understand that, you know, that, that Beowulf is completely pagan in his not absence of knowledge of Christ, but it's, Every, most everybody agrees it's a poem written by a Christian looking back at the the sort of longing for the the heroic age and the the sort of g- glory and glamour and sorrow of yeah. that lost that lost time hmm. from a Christian perspective there's only truth right I just have to say <laughs> it's like there's truth and that's it right so anything that is of truth is going to be Christian regardless of if the people themselves knew Christ, right? It's like, it's, it's the problem of knowledge and revelation, right? That, that we, and Plato is worrying about this too. Like, where do our ideas come from? Where do it, where does our knowledge come from? It, it means Augustine was a great Neoplatonist. You know, they're, they're all reading, they're reading Plato and recognizing there's a philosophical ground that matches mm. our theological understanding that there is a philosophical grounding to the truth that we know by revelation and so, you know, th- that's what Aquinas, you know, s- synthesizes well. It's, it's what Christians believe throughout the Middle Ages, that reason is a, is a God-given faculty, and therefore those things that we can know through reason and logic fit with the revelation. They can't contradict it. Um, therefore, m- you know, medieval philosophers reading Plato and seeing it as a great mythos, I mean, Plato writes myth, not just logic, uh, th- they'll recognize it as participating in that kind of same kind of story truth. It, there's not a contra- There's not. A, there's not going to be a contradiction philosophically right. for these medieval Christian thinkers. Right. So flesh out for me a little bit. I mean, at the Madison program, I think Aquinas, natural law, is definitely an area of interest. Is I mean, with Tolkien being a Catholic, is there a connection there between that and the Lord of the Rings? Well, we have a we have a book of his library or yeah. like what he had. He definitely had Aquinas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I think the copy belonged to one of his t- teachers, so he ended up with mm. Aquinas. He's frustrating though because I'm I'm talking all the time about story and creation, and Tolkien's very Catholic. Mm. He does not do theology. It, it, it's like it's very very frustrating to f- get him to argue through any actual doctrinal positions. He does worry, you said, immortality. He worries a lot in his own letters and his his backstory writing about what it means to be um, in, incarnate. It, it, he doesn't talk about Christ incarnation, but he does talk about what we are as incarnate minds, right? We belong in bodies. Uh, if, if, you're, if your listeners um, are really curious about this, the Notion Club papers um, are very fun to read because they're this testing of char- characters in a time travel story that's set in 2000 in the 1980s published in 2012 blah, blah, blah. it's 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 funny because he was very aware of like forward projection too of of, of history mm. um that the characters are trying to understand how would you know things from the past how could you time travel how could you share memories with a meteorite or something like that and and all of it comes down to this problem of language as being something that you mm. carry in your physical 
real itself, right? Incarnate minds. Um, th that Tolkien plays with, right? So he's worried about immortality and death and why death is a gift and things like that. He doesn't deal, he doesn't do, you know, what most people recognize as, as straight up theology, right? Arguing the Trinity uh, or, you know, actually arguing the incarnation. What I think he's doing is, from my perspective as a medievalist, simply much more monastic. Hmm. It comes out of the liturgy. It comes out of the daily prayers. It comes out of the Psalms. So it comes out of the poetry and the expression of joy. And everything Tolkien does is constantly at that level, right? It's, it's, and and monastic, monastic meditation is also going to be artistic. You're going to have buildings, you're going to have music, art, um, you know, the, 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 the beauty of the language that you're speaking in, the beauty of the storytelling, all of that is Tolkien's theology in the sense to, to reiterate, you know, going back to that feeling of we are creatures who are, whose purpose is to sing praises, and thanksgiving for that creation. Hmm. Wow. I'm going to, just because I'm a former recovering linguist and I have to ask, let's talk a little bit about Tolkien as a philologist um, because most linguists are not, well, at least at the undergraduate level, like so self-aware about the creation of the field um, and that there, the sort of deep distinctions between philology, which was sort of Tolkien's origin, and more technical linguistics, which is what people do now. And I think, as someone who's sort of interested in both, one of the major distinctions is that philology does have sometimes even an outright theological, but I think always a very humanistic element, one in which um, you're studying language for beauty and for its own sake, trying to tell a story. Linguistics, which I also love, but it's a, a social science, I think, on the harder side of the social sciences. It's quite technical. And so Tolkien, I mean, I kind of wonder, the, the landscape on that has changed so much since his lifetime. To me, from what you're saying, it seems so much like the soul of a, of a philologist. Do you think that the sort of more technical linguistic side is something that he would look on happily and say he's happy to participate in as well, or something that he would naysay? So philology for him was history. So it's a his, it's a historical practice, and so and he's he's primarily trained one just because he loved languages so much, and yeah. he talks about them having different flavors and and so forth. So it's very aesthetic and sensory for him. Um, that he's his major philological training is working on the Oxford English Dictionary in W's <laughs> um, and writing those history entries. Right, the etymologies are histories. A lot of good Anglo-Saxon words with the W. That's a good one for him. <laughs> yes. Well, he did waistcoat and walnut and you know, wall. <laughs> um, and and so, I mean, in 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 his training, he thinks of language as a, a kind of. I mean, it's 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 a cultural artifact. He said he said he wrote the Lord of the Rings to provide the the his languages with a story, right? That he'd been inventing those elvish languages. The before and after in his description of what he was up to is always a little questionable, right? Which came first, the stories or the languages? But anyway, they, they they travel together for him because he sees that you know language points to the culture that animates it, and the 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 culture that animates it generates the language, and so he's he's very interested in that. He his his scholarly output was minimal. <laughs> But but what he did publish included things like his study of the the actual dialect of the Ankara Navissa. This it's a rule for anchoresses, so right? it's a monastic rule for women who lived hmm. as hermits attached to a church. And what he you know he found his proof in the in his study of the Ankara Navissa was that it was a Midland dialect, right? So mm, of German, you mean? No, Midland England. Right, oh, it's a, it's a Midland okay. England dialect, and so if, for, as far as he was concerned, it's like again, it's another of these history traces, right? Gives you access back in time. I, I think he main from my from my perspective, what he 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 enjoyed it was mainly that feeling of time travel that he was after. That sense of if you if you have these words and they're embedded by way of their generation in this story you can by way of studying the word get back to that story get back get back in back in time so i don't know whether he would have enjoyed the more um sonic grammatical technical element of modern linguistics but 
I think he might have. I'm not sure. I just think he he would have put it to different uses. He he would yeah. have seen it as a a tool to give him that glimpse of the reality that he was after. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think I think there there are plenty of people who come into it for sort of more philological reasons and find other things in it that they like and kind of the more technical element of it. I mean, the fact of the matter is to write a dictionary entry on the etymology of walnut is pretty technical work. I think there's sort of no way around it in a sense. Oh, I know he, I mean, he clearly enjoyed it. Yeah. He, he clearly yeah, yeah. enjoyed it because he made his own like STEM, STEM dictionaries of his etymologies. Um, I, I've been trying to think about it. It's like the, he's very synesthetic in his descriptions of what he's doing. So the ta- language is taste rather than you think they talk about sound, right? Cause he's so interested in music, but no, the languages have taste, but then he thinks about mm. a creation as sonic w- with the Anna Lindele and the singing. Um, he, 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 he was, I don't think he composed his own music. He, he had Donald Swan write tunes for some of the, the songs, right? But he did draw. So he has his, his mother's ability to, to, to drafting and sort of graphic art. Um, he loved doing, but at the end of his life, he, he spent a lot of time doing doodles, basically, <laughs> on his crossword puzzles um, that were heraldic shields of the different characters. And so you could see that he's always trying this, this technical, this technical love of precision in art. So I think he would have taken modern linguistics that way, whatever technical elements it would have, he would feed it back into his delight in the beauty. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about just the aesthetic of the whole book is it's very, I mean, especially when you compare it to more recent fantasy books, like I think Game of Thrones is the most obvious example, but there are definitely others. Those are very, I mean, first of all, they lean heavy into the paganism um, and heavy into the sex, which is not present in Tolkien. Um, But I mean, they also have this kind of cultic, rich, heavy element in it. And Tolkien's work is and his languages also just in their sound. It's very light and airy and uplifting. Um, And, you know, Game of Thrones and The Witcher and, you know, these other fantasy things like that, they have these, they're basically nihilistic in in their purpose, I think. Um, They're meant to show that religion is fake and everything's sort of pointless. Um, I, I mean, I just wonder if you can comment a little bit on how it happened that, if Tolkien is sort of the inventor of this genre, that the vast majority of later popular literature in this genre took such a dramatic shift. Um, So we'll start with I'm Christian. (laughs) (laughs) If you haven't guessed, and it's, it's true, right? It's the truth. We, we, we inhabit the truth and um, evil can only corrupt. That's yeah. Okay. So, so there you go, <laughs> right? And and no, it, and, and the efficient answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that to say, I mean, you said it. Uh, you know that that I I personally can't read Game of Thrones or watch more than one episode oh, I, of it I without get through it either. I <laughs> really, really the the nihilism that you're describing, which I understand George R. R. Martin was going for purposefully. It was like to to de romanticize. Tolkien and you know Tolkien's romantic but in the in not in the sense that his characters all have happy endings except for because except for Christianity does right, right. <laughs> um that there's a purpose there's meaning right that's our happy ending maybe not absence of su- suffering but meaningfulness so n- nihilism you say nihilism the the, the the fundamentally most depressing thing about it is it's nihilistic yeah <laughs> it says there's no meaning and that can only be parasitic on the joy of purpose, which we have as creatures of a loving creator, right? And, and it, that's saying culture is worship, right? It's, it's, it's how you worship. It's what you worship. If your culture, if your worship is of our creator and joy, the things that surround you are going to partake of that joy and, and loveliness. If your culture, if the thing you worship is Sauron, because he's promising you, immor- you know, immortality against your creation, you know, against your, your created mortality, which is another problem with the fall, which we can go there. It's, then it's going to be 
it's going to feel um, depressing. And it's interesting that those, that the fantasy you're talking about is all taken up with sex because of it's sterility. It's taken yeah. up with, it, it can be taken up with sex, right? But it is sterile sexuality. Whereas Tolkien, I could, I just, just stumbled because I can't remember which elf is related to whom. <laughs> Tolkien is everything is it's constantly genealogies. What are genealogies, but records of sex, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sam and Rosie had a lot of sex because they had a lot of kids. <laughs> so there's sex in everywhere in Tolkien, but it is fertile. It's 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 creative. It's creative and joyous, and it's not sterile and 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 nihilistic. Yeah, and I could suppose you could say the same thing about religion in Tolkien that it's present and it's not perfunctory in the same way that inventing some fire cult like they do in Game of Thrones is just for the sake of showing that it's a cult. Well, that's to say the Tolkien took worship seriously. Yeah. And I, so I was thinking, I was, I just spent the, the last week in Santa Fe and was told by a guard in one of the museums that in fact, George R.R. R. Martin has, I don't know whether he owns it or whether he's, 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 he's um, labeled as sort of head builder or something like that in mm. Meow Wolf, which as a artistic production is rather interesting. Um, hey, what'd you say? Sorry. Meow Wolf. Sorry. What? what? <laughs> meow. Like the cat. Cat says uh-huh. meow. Wolf. Like wolf, oh. wargs, but wolves, right? Okay. And 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 <laughs> what, what meow wolf is is a, it's an art. It started in Santa Fe as an artistic collective, oh. and they try to overlay it with some kind of story, which kind of works. And you're supposed to like, it's it's like an, an installation that's house sized or building sized, so you crawl around it. It's lots of um, black light and distorted views and it's 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 rather fun but apparently martin has been involved in that all along so maybe he has more an artistic bent than i realized he also apparently lives in santa fe and wanted to have a castle there and the they're pretty strict building um uh codes in santa fe and everything except look adobe so i guess he didn't get to build his castle but <laughs> it's um that it, Martin, it, everybody has to talk about Martin as deriving from Tolkien. Yeah, right. 100%. And we t- we talk about Tolkien as deriving from the scriptures. I mean, it's great fanfic of you know creation. It's all art is always referential, but what are you? What's your reference? What is your what, what is your reference going to be? I don't know The Witcher, so I, I think maybe I watched it once and it's dark. <laughs> I mean, literally, it's just dark, right? It's very dark. <laughs> the palette is dark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, to some extent, unfortunately, I think most of those kind of modern spinoff fantasy shows are essentially the same. I think you could easily substitute one for the other in terms of the plots and, and most other things about it. So it's kind of interesting that the original is so differentiated from most things that came after it. Um, but I want to ask about um, the political, I'm not going to say program, I'm going to say implications, because just from my kind of cursory knowledge, I suspect Tolkien himself might have bristled at the word program. Um, but the political implications within Lord of the Rings, um, from my understanding, Tolkien stayed out of it and might not have liked people looking at his work from that perspective. I guess my counter would be a lot of things have been politicized since Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings. So, I mean, kind of given, especially what we were talking about before, about this push towards nihilism um, that has really infiltrated our culture, do you have any thoughts on if there is kind of an implicit political, maybe ideology is too strong a word, but political message in Lord of the Rings? Well, the third book is called The Return of the King. Yeah, well, which is a political, <laughs> there are political, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are political entities, but that's not really the same as saying that there, it has political things to say about us, I guess. Uh, well, I, okay, right, in the sense that <laughs> it's still called The Return of the King. Right, um, right. <laughs> and, and you recognize that it's, uh, one, it's a massive critique of modern politics, and Saruman, all by himself, is the one great, the one greatest critique of modern propaganda. Since what Saruman does when he's standing at uh, the, the the company is his, you know his his factories have been flooded and the trees have taken them back, and Gandalf is there with Aragorn and and Theoden and the the hobbits and and Legolas and Gimli, and they're all listening mm-hmm. to the voice from the tower, right? Yeah. To- <laughs> 
<laughs> and they hear whatever, you know, it's like there, he's a politician. Saruman is a modern politician trying to, you know, persuade each of them to side with him, dismiss the others. Right. It's like when, when, I, I can't remember which of the hobbits is thinking about it, but you know, the, the, the when Saruman's telling Gandalf for this ragtag dangling at your, your back or something, right. That that's the way modern politicians talk. They're always trying to get on the side of whoever they're talking to, but they're lying constantly. I think, to, I think in fact, and I, d- I did an episode on this in my own live stream um, called Sauron's Mike. My, my live stream is the Mosaic Arc and the episode is Sauron's Mike. Sauron is the image of modern politics, bluntly. Um, and the, the argument that I made in that, in that episode is that the tower, the reason he has that great tower is, and he's only a voice by that point in, in the second age with Numenor, when he's persuading them to human sacrifice, mm. he can be embodied still, but after the fall of Numenor and the flood and, and the, the, you know, the, the, the faithful run away to middle earth and found Gondor, then Sauron can't take embodied form anymore, but what he has therefore is the eye and you know, he has a mouth too, right? The mouth that shows up outside the gates. My, my argument is he's basically functioning like the radio. Mm. And this, this takes a, a little detour through Marshall McLuhan, another Catholic convert who studied a lot of medieval education and was therefore very aware of the power of rhetoric and also of the effects of media. Right. Anybody like Tolkien who, oh, was trained as a signaling officer for or right, he, he knew how to use carrier pigeons, among other things. That, that would be great, right? Um, he, well, and he, language itself. Language itself, yeah, but he's, which he's is trained. Like he's, his yeah. wartime training was a signaling officer, right? That's right. that's what he was doing in the Battle of the Somme. Um, he is hyper aware of the problem of of media, the problem of propaganda. Sauron. Uh, people say, "Oh, it's an atomic bomb or something." No, it's the power of the voice to mm. compel or persuade or control other people's wills. That's modern politics. If you want to say, where are we right now in our political existence? We're at, you know, at the mercy or at the, 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 um, I don't know where, the, if you become aware of it, then it's like, if you can break Saruman's spell while he's talking to you, you break mm. Sauron's apparent power to be able to mobilize armies by way of his, projection of his will through modern media, then you know what we're up against. Yeah. So then is, is the ring the same thing as Saruman in that sense? Is there a distinction? I mean, in terms of what they represent, if they, do they both represent um, distorted information and the power of information to corrupt or not information, power of persuasion to corrupt, however you, you think is best to phrase it? Yes. I mean, the, the thing is, the world that they're participating in is all of that. And right? recognize theologically, this is a world in which the word became flesh. So we're very conscious of the power of language and the power of the incarnation. Um, but what you see throughout the story is the, the, the power of um, the, the exertion of will, which is politics, right? What's politics? Domination of others' wills? Yeah. You know, what's authority and and the return of the king is this return to I mean Aragorn you know Aragorn one he had to win his bride it's a romance in that sense that he has to win his kingdom in order to get the princess um w- once he's back and it's no longer the steward holding on Denethor is also a you know cautionary tale because he's the steward who has the lineage you know he's inherited being steward Boromir should have been steward after him. They should have been the most powerful, but the king is the one that's actually the 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 right the rightful authority. Um, when Aragorn returns, peace returns to all of the different elements of his. I mean, it's an empire, is Gondor an empire of his kingdom, so that the Shire has its own local government back. Right. It's the, 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 what Saruman tries to do as Sharky is you know, exert himself over that little, little territory and the hobbits show up and they're able to throw him out and Sam becomes mayor. And the king is down there in Gondor, um, but he's not bothering the the Shire with his overlordship, right? So I think, you know, there's a, as again, Tolkien, he, d- he shows rather than theorizes what he wants you to understand. And that local government, which is basically not in your face all the time, 
as the, the hobbits enjoying the Shire, the king who, you know, loves his kingdom and, and serves out of love, but doesn't grasp, but doesn't try to right. like stay alive forever. He willingly dies. All of that, I think, is is part of Tolkien's positive political vision. But the negative version is what Saruman tries to sorry Sauron tries to do with the Ring, which is dominate others' wills and and do it both. You know, Saruman makes his armies of orcs and tries to conquer Rohan with it, you know militarily. Sauron has his own armies, and they come and you know try to besiege um, Gondor, Minas Tirith, and that you know the sort of imperial desire the, the the strongest political argument that Tolkien makes is where he's worrying in one of his letters to Christopher about how the world is basically to become all one great americanized global blah sorry <laughs> sorry world <laughs> My bad. <laughs> He's not wrong, right? It's like this great globalized empire, Coca-Cola, branded and, and ex- yeah, yeah, yeah. extended out there. In fairness, the British started it, but I digress. <laughs> I agree. I agree. We've talked about that a lot on the Mosaic Arc. What, and that's why, going back to saying Tolkien studies of the Ankara Navissa and finding out that there's this, mm. this Midland dialect embedded in, he liked the local. He, he, he liked gardens that you took care of yourself in the local. And that's his political, that's his political vision, which is saying, you know, modern politics of expansion and domination is evil. Yeah. All right. Well, I promise to return to immortality and we've only got a couple minutes left. I have not forgotten. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think when we're talking about politics, it's such an interesting area of focus because uh, it's in some way, in many ways like a perennial human question but I think during the pandemic one that became suddenly extremely present and that kind of discussion about what is mortality what is immortality as people were making you know real life on the ground policies is one that I at least felt maybe people should have discussed more deeply and thought about more carefully so I guess with that in mind what is Tolkien's message broadly on mortality and immortality? Well, that's why Sauron is able to convince the Numenorians to practice human sacrifice. Yeah. Because they don't want to die. The, 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 Numer- the Numenorian kings become grasping, right? <laughs> what happens when Gollum has the ring too long, <laughs> right? And that, that grasping you know, right. the precious that you're never going to let go. Right. That's why Aragorn, I mean, he, he returns as king. He has to, you know, win the kingdom, defeats Sauron, which he doesn't, right? It's actually Gollum by way of biting the ring off of Frodo's finger, right? That, that defeats Sauron. But Aragorn willingly dies. And Arwen is, of course, in the, in the appendix when that happens, upset with him because why can't you just stay alive? And... Tolkien always talks about mortality as Iluvatar's gift to men. And all of his meditation is on that, the horror of trying to live forever within this mm. world and, and refusing the offer that, that God gives us of entering into heaven with him. So he's, I mean, I, I think, I, I, I know that one of the things that, over the last several years in, in the COVID moment, I had thinking about the whole time was that the way COVID was playing was as a ring. Hmm. It was as this, you know, one COVID to rule them all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> one that, but that, 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 you know, the ring, what the ring promised was, you know, this invisibility and all, you know, all of affecting um, power, but it also promised longevity. Yeah. Cause that's what Gollum got. And Gollum shows you what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, I know we're running up against time here, but if you'll permit me one last question, I want to ask a little bit more about the ring, which is so central. Um, And we've kind of skirted around it a bit. You've suggested that the ring has to do with, uh, I keep almost saying information, but information is true with persuasion, which is potentially not true. Oh, persuasion is emotionally true. That's very powerful. (laughs) Dialectic and rhetoric—they're both—they're two—they're two different—they're two different arts. 
and and they both have power. Sophistry? I don't know. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that the ring has to do with the yeah with the ability to to spread lies and falsehood um, and the corrupting power of persuasion. Um, and I kind of wonder. I think it's hard to read Lord of the Rings now and not see some sort of opioid epidemic esque like the extreme addictive power of the ring. I think given a lot of modern problems is so salient. What I'm wondering is what when you're digging into like what the ring really is, why didn't Tolkien say it? And is there some reason why? Because to me, if you're like, well, Tolkien's a Christian, why wouldn't it be something like original sin? What he says, he says in his letter, I think it's to Peter Hastings, that his his purpose was to make visible and physical the effects of sin and misused free will. Yeah. Okay. And the ring is about free will. The, the ring is, I mean, so, and, and one, to so recognize that the reason Frodo technically fails is because he says, the, I do not do that thing, you know, I choose to do. I, the ring is mine, right? And, and so he chooses. He, he, makes, he makes that choice. That the, 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 the effects of choice are very, very powerful in the story that when you, again, when you pay attention to it carefully, and Tolkien's always very precise with his language, always, 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 the, 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 the like, Aragorn's decisions, whether to go with, to go, to try to go with Frodo and Sam to Mordor or to go rescue Merry and Pippin, who may be dead, he has to choose and he's worried about making a good choice. His learning to be king is about making good choices. The major chapter um, in the, what happens in Mordor is the choices of master Samwise, all of which are very important. Mm. He has to make a choice. Yeah about what to do, whether he thinks Frodo's dead, well, he's not, but should he take the ring? Master, Samwise, master, Frodo is the master, not Sam. Sam is, serves master Frodo, right? And so this whole, it's like, he's a mat, he ha- we are given choice, right? And that free will is critical for Tolkien throughout that the reason the ring is evil is it seeks to eradicate creatures' free will, dominate other wills and, you know, our, but our burden also, uh, you know, being made in the image and likeness is being made with the choice. So Tolkien is trying to demonstrate that. And the, and the ring is, it's a temptation. I think mm. it's, it's always, it's always a temptation. And you can say, if we think I'd spent a lot of last year reading Marshall McLuhan's work on media, if you recognize that whatever we're doing, I mean, including like talking now over, over the internet, um, gets uh, the more you try to grasp onto our our artifacts the more we fall into sin it's not that the creation is bad it's not that our our works are nece- are you know it's like our art is bad it's when you become grasping of it and and you're trying to hold on to it and the ring is you know it's beautiful and the temptation is always to want to control yeah so that's why it it, it works if you think of it in terms of media in the sense of extensions of ourselves not just communication, but all all extensions of ourselves, houses and roads and cities and, and things like that. Anything that, you know, what Sauron wants is the whole of Middle Earth. He wants to control the world. Mm. Well, I think we're just about at time, but that was a really stirring note to end on. I really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> um, and I have to tell you, I when I was, as I was preparing for this, I was like, Oh, Lord of the Rings is so long. I definitely don't have time to read it all again. And after a certain amount of time listening to your lectures, I gave up and I read it all again. So thank you <laughs> at the very least for <laughs> And maybe it did take a lot of time, but it was a really fun summer. So <laughs> I can at the very least well, thank you good. for that. <laughs> It's, 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 there's, 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 you know, people, re- re- this is one of the themes of my course that you reread it, right? And it's yeah, like, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's one of the rare books in my experience that each time you read it, it, sh- it, you know, it, it changes for you. I mean, I, it, it certainly changed for me over the course of my life, right? It's like the, 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 the thing that you're, well, you read it when you're 11, which is the age when most people first encounter it. <laughs> you know, what's amazing I tried to read it when I was 11 and I gave up at Tom Bombadil. I was like, this is crazy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, my trajectory is I read it at 11 yeah. and I loved it, right? And then I read it at 13 and was, was you know, <laughs> upset there weren't more kissing in it, right? Or mm, tough. Know, and, 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 and then I read it, I think in college and graduate school and I started realizing, wait a minute, there's, there's, there, there's kissing throughout this. It's just really like, you know. <laughs>
Arwen and Aragorn. Oh my gosh, that's hot. It's, um, <laughs> and, and and the thing is, each each time you read it, you realize how many layers he's mm-hmm. folded into his meditation on our condition. It's I think it's one of the greatest great. It's it's one of the great works of world literature. So definitely worth reading and rereading. Hundred percent. Yeah, I I think my experience in my relatively. I mean, I also gave up reading fiction for a number of years. So I'm a little behind on some of this, but I, I think in my experience with great literature, the first reread is often the best read because mm. you get to really experience it in sort of more detail for the first time, especially if you've read something about it in between. So this was actually my first reread and I read the Silmarillion in between and it's amazing how differently I experienced it the second time. So well, so for your listeners, I, I did a whole series um, on but the craft, so Tolkien's craft, and much more on the Silmarillion in my videos on unauthorized.tv, which you have to subscribe to. But if you subscribe, you get everybody's videos and you, you, you get all of my Tolkien videos. And also there's a channel there called Logos and History where we put our mosaic arc videos as well. So there's, there's more out there. And if you want to do, if you want to do the, the deep, deep dive into the Summerillion, <laughs> I have videos. <laughs> I went there. <laughs> well, the link to that will be in the show notes. So thank you so much again. I really appreciate you taking the time. This was really, really fun and a great, I think Lord of the Rings is a great autumn read. So may, may that be advice to the listeners. <laughs> the, 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 the birthday party's coming up. Yes, September the birthday 22nd party is coming. And- <laughs> The journey for those of you who are reading on the Christian, the Christian, the Christian calendar. The journey from Rivendell begins on December twenty fifth, mm. and Baradir falls on March twenty fifth. Ah, good fact, excellent. All right, well, for the third <laughs> time for real, <laughs> we're ending the conversation. Thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Professor Rachel Fulton Brown of the University of Chicago on the work of J.R.R. Tolkien. The syllabus of her course, Tolkien, Medieval and Modern, is linked in the show notes, as well as her blog, Fencing Bear at Prayer, and her series of audio lectures, The Forge of Tolkien, which I listened to to prepare for this interview. They're really, really excellent. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really encourage you to like and subscribe and even leave us a review. They all really are helpful and mean a lot to us here at the Madison Program. You can also find us on social media, on Twitter at Madison Program and on Instagram and Facebook, and most importantly, on our website, jmp.princeton.edu. There, you can sign up for our mailing list. You can also get access to all of our previous lectures that we've had here on Princeton's campus on a really wide variety of really fascinating topics. So I really encourage you to check them out. And it's the start of a new year, so we have a really packed schedule of future events coming up here at Princeton. So you can check in and see what we have coming down the pike. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate having you here. And I can't wait to see you next time here on Madison's Notes. Madison's Notes.